Welcome y bienvenidos to this episode of the Cultural Capacity Podcast. I am one of your hostesses here, Justine Gonzalez. And once a month, the reason we call these episodes Cultural Capacity, you see one of our team's frameworks in the background. That's our Cultural Capacity Framework. We use it with a lot of things we get to do at the Educator Aid um, Consulting Firm here with me and my teammates. So I'm really excited for you all to meet our guests today. Because any conversation we have here once a month, we get to not only learn from people's story and who they are, their lived experiences, but we also dive into conversations about culture, communications, and learn from industry professionals who are doing incredibly innovative things. They are thought leaders. Um, and today's guest is no different. You all know if you've been here for a while, I'd like to start by giving people their flowers. In other words, I notice. Um, I notice I'm a very observant person, and I've been that way since I was a kid, but when I interact with people and I meet them, um, I love the art of conversation. I love the art of getting to know someone, and so we hope that through these interviews, you get to do the same. Um, I've actually gotten the opportunity to interview our guest one other time at a collaborative podcast I did with Blake Nathan, the founder and CEO of Educate Me Foundation of which I am a board member. You often see that linked in our show notes. Um, but he and I got a chance to interview Jeff, who happens to be not only a leader in education, but also in finance. Um, so this is a good, I'm really excited about this interview, Jeff, because many of our guests, maybe they wouldn't pair those two together. Um, I don't know. But I know that I learn so much from you every time we get to talk. Our paths first cross probably five or six years ago. Um, we've both done work in Indianapolis, which uh, we do have a global audience that's in the center uh, Midwest of the United States. And so he and I crossed paths there, though neither of us are originally from there. Um, both of us have done some work there. So I'm excited to introduce our guest. Um, before I go further, please make sure that you hit subscribe. We are so grateful for you here and for stopping through. And we love to do what we do. We we sponsor this through our company. And that is where we're at with it now. But please hit subscribe. It does help us continue to bring phenomenal guests such as Jeff today. And so I would be remiss if I didn't give you your flowers, Jeff. And before you kick off and introduce us to you through your own way of introducing yourself. I want to first point out one of the first conversations I got to have with you years ago, I noticed you were you had first moved to Indianapolis when we met and you spoke very much about family. And so that stood out to me um, because you already, it was very clear, your priorities in your professional life were driven by your values of legacy you're creating and your commitment to that legacy and growth for your family, your wife, your children, the decision that you've been made to come to Indianapolis and move from New York. Um, and then the second thing would be your vulnerability as a leader. I, I know some of the work you've done, just a, a small amount from just the headlines and different things like that. Um, but I know that you have such a footprint, so many places, and you've worked across numerous states, perhaps even countries that I'm unaware of. I don't know. So I'm excited to learn more about you. But I also wanted to commend you and say, I appreciate your vulnerability as a leader and every time we get a chance to catch up. So without further ado, our guest at the Cultural Capacity Table today is the Jeffrey Fenelis. Did I say your last name properly? Fenelis, yeah, Fenelis, close though. Fenelis. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Could it be either which way? I prefer to say Fenelis. Okay, got it. I, I appreciate you taking the time to connect with me and I, I'll give you files back. I appreciate your authenticity your ability to listen, and your ability just to show up for people. Um, it means a lot. Um, quick way to introduce myself. Quick thing, I'll just clean that up a little bit. I'm definitely an educator at Educator's Heart, and I actually wanted to do finance and be an investment banker, but currently I'm actually doing benefit strategy, which still connects to financial it's institutions and structures as well. But my name is Jeffrey Fenellis. I'm actually originally from Brooklyn, New York, but now I reside in Indianapolis. Um, just to little, give you a little span of like my brief history, what, what actually drives me. My mom's an immigrant from Haiti who left Haiti during a dictatorship to come to mm -hmm. the United States to ensure that, you know, she can maximize the opportunity she has for herself personally and for her kids. Um, my mom's a genius. She's brilliant. Mm -hmm. And she loves Haiti. Haiti was a beautiful place. But structural systems in place um, created 
things that makes the country seems to be super unstable, but there's rich history there. And my mom's a part of that history as well. Um, and with that being said, though, one of the structures that impacted Haiti and my mother was that a large percentage of the population was illiterate. So mm -hmm. once again, my mom's beautiful, brilliant, can do many things, but was not able to read until later mm -hmm. on in her life. Mm -hmm. and he, when I think about that, that's a guiding post for me, not because my mom's inability, but because of what happens when systems and structures get in the way of people's potential. So yeah. for me, what drives me is how do we eradicate, remove, and think about ways that remove barriers that get in the way of people getting a fair shot to reach their potential. Mm. So that drives me in everything I do and how I see and think about the world in general. So with that being said, I originally was not going to be an educator. I wanted to be an investment banker. So when I came from a mom that didn't make much money, I wanted to make as much money as possible. I graduated in 2009. The market cra crashed in 2008. And I had uh -huh. to figure it out because I was a first generation kid. I couldn't figure out anything else but figure out how to make money. I ended up working a political campaign. And mm. through that campaign, I was chairing the education um, speech to draw people in. And at the point in time, I decided, you know what, I potentially could do this stuff as well, because a leader during that time period mm -hmm. was really trying to create a space in which he's trying to reform education, good or bad, but it, it drew my, it drew me. I always coach basketball, so I was trying to leverage my experience as being a coach to figure mm -hmm. out how to be a teacher. I went to being a special education teacher in the Department of Education of New York City. Mm -hmm. I, I moved out of that and we actually worked in a charter organization as a dean, then assistant principal, and then I worked for a community um, based school um, in the Red Hook section of Brooklyn. And that's when I actually found my true passion and where we did actually school turnaround slash transformation work, which I really, really enjoyed because it really furthered my emphasis on people and potential and removing barriers for that. And lastly, after, you know, we was able to work on collectively transforming that school, we then moved, I moved, I was charged to move to Indianapolis where I was looking to do further work on transformation through policy driven um, processes that allowed schools to incubate and partner with the district to do school turnaround. Um, somehow, some way, COVID-19 happened, <laughs> things in direction. And ultimately um, I ended up launching the school and then things were going well, but I just thought long-term, instead of being having a single site school, sustainability wise and I wanted to think like what's best for the kids long term so I decided to merge that school um with a larger institution and then I kind of just pivoted away from doing direct work with schools um currently and for, for a long time I've always did my own education consultancy just around school turnaround school transformation strategic coaching for CEOs superintendents executive directors principals to make sure that I help hold them accountable to their vision and goals for what they want to see as it relates to outcomes for, for students. I am a proud disciple of Dr. Anthony Muhammad around school transformation. We bonded over this, you all. This was a bond because we both yes. have turnaround background. Yeah. Um, I will also say too, I, I want to point out something you said really quick. So audience, hears it again. He did and made a very difficult decision as a school leader to do what was best for children. So I just want to point that out because that's my heart and soul. And I know you and I connected so much about culture yeah. and passion too. So back to you. Sorry, just wanted to no, make sure that point. everybody peeped that. And I'd say it's what I thought was best for children. You yes. know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And I think that's really important. And I think that's yeah. something that anyone would ever want to talk about. I love having conversations around that any point in time. But I think ultimately what it led to me to do is actually do some more digger, um, some deeper dives. I've been working in education and I've been honestly working really hard for 10 years as a principal, as an executive director, as a founder. I've always taught every single year when I led a school. So I, I was yep. tired. And Same. Then, Same. Tired. And, I, and then <laughs> at that point in time, I was like, what can I do differently that can still have impact with education? Um, through a policy or policy or measurement that matters to folks that people may not see as a huge point. And one day... A friend of mine who was a former teacher and school principal, whose wife was also a principal, um, decided to step away from his role as a principal so his wife can continue doing the work. And a couple of years later, we had a conversation as I'm at this you know, crux, like, what am I going to do next? And he was like, you know what? I left and I started doing insurance because my family owned insurance. And it's very transferable to schools because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, servicing people. 
And schools need this because they have to have a broker, but we're not brokers. We are really advisors and we know schools and we're passionate about it. So it's more than just business as usual. We're constantly thinking about what's best for the kids, but we know it's by the way of the adults. I think you'd be really good at it. And I was like, what? He said, you know what? Let me connect you to my friend. And my friend will actually explain this better. And I just want you to listen. And I had two conversations and I was left intrigued because the conversation was not even about insurance, employee benefits or strategy. It was about how do we do right by people mm. and how do we do right by people so collectively so organizations could keep them and retain them so that they can be as productive as possible to move it to move it forward. And then I narrowed, I said, how about if we take that into schools? Right, right. Focus on that. I care about schools and I like this. How do I bring this together? And that's what brings me in today as currently I'm an advisor at NFP, which is a global insurance brokerage firm that, and I'm leading the work around supporting school districts, K through 12, and even early learning yeah. as well as nonprofit organizations and social impact companies connected to education and youth with employee benefits. Hmm. Oh, so we might need to set up a separate call. <laughs> um, so awesome. Awesome. Let's, let's go back real quick. So if you're just diving in or maybe you fast forward or whatever, wherever you're at in this podcast, we've kicked off. We've heard a little bit about Jeff's story and who he is. Um, and I like to call this part of our podcast, this segment, Cultural Connectors. It's like a rapid fire questions round. Um, and we are actually, you're the first guest that I'm doing this with. I've done some restructuring actually over the past few months. So you're the first person that is getting these questions, Jeff, as you, part of my you. cultural connectors. And just a little side note, teaching part, if you're listening, um, when you think about connecting with people, and I actually get these questions a lot, uh, is how do I connect in ways that are relevant to the person I'm speaking with? And sometimes we make this too difficult or we try to force small talk. Instead of it just being natural of like, oh, I'm waiting in line at a coffee shop and I go, oh, I love this song, right? If you want to strike up a conversation with someone, we're not always in the, in the mood, but sometimes I think um, as humans and especially surviving the global pandemic, which we are all grateful to be here today, sometimes we overthink just connecting with people in natural ways. But these are examples of questions if they would come up in conversation, not because you should force them but naturally to have conversation, they're kind of more broad universal versus trying to like, oh, I see Jeff at, in the in the teacher's lounge or the workspace lounge, and I'm trying to tell him about my favorite show. And maybe he has no context for that. And he's like, I don't, I don't know what that is, right? So these are more universal questions versus, oh, I'm so specific with one thing that I like. So the first one, you have to choose an anthem to walk on stage to. What is going to be your song, Jeff, that you walk out to? <laughs> the anthem to walk out to? Mm -hmm. For you, you've been introduced onto a stage. Yeah, yeah, I think it would definitely be, um, um, it would be a Jay-Z song. Um, and definitely, yeah, I, I'll just say it. Just say it. Reintroduce myself. Like that would be my intro. I love uh, it. Okay. We'll watch thanks. for it. We'll watch for your TED talk to come out to that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's my jam. We um next question. We all get to transport back in time with you to one of your favorite childhood meals. What are we eating? And give us a little bit of context. You know what? When I was a kid for my birthday, my mom would make this meal. And actually today is my birthday. And I used to get this meal. So <laughs> Yeah. Hey, feliz cumpleaños. Oh, happy birthday, man. I didn't Thank even you. know. <laughs> so my mom would make, I mean, would make rice, lima beans, grilled chicken with shrimp in it. And that was like one of my favorite, favorite dishes. That sounds good. Delicious. Okay. What's on your bookshelf right now? Give us one or two books that is top of mind for Jeff that you're kind of either browsing through, listening on Audible. It'll give us some recommendations too from a uh, benefits uh, and retention specialists? <laughs> well, it's a spectrum. So I, I still study education, right? And I still do. So one book is IET um, by Roxane Gay. Roxane Gay. Um, the other book is, I'm reading Bettina, both of Bettina Love's books, oh. which are very cool. Um, um, Time for Change by Dr. Anthony Muhammad. And for a benefits standpoint, um, there's this great book. And actually the, the title just slipped my name. So I think it's called the, the the price we pray we we pray, which really does a, it does a deep dive into like um, transparency around pay for um, in like the medical industry, and it's just oh. really important. You know? It's very okay. transparent and very powerful. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir, for those recommendations. Final, if you had a quote that you think of off the top of your head that drives and inspires you for your life's journey and path, what would it be and why? Difficult takes a day, impossible takes a week. I mean, difficult takes a day, impossible, is it? I apologize. I can't remember it. Jay-Z. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Um, so this Jay Z quote that uh, he okay. says um, in Kanye West's Dim "Diamonds Are Forever," where he talks oh, about like, okay. you know, like, you know, when something's difficult, it takes like a day, and possible takes a week or whatever it is for him. And for me, that's just powerful because it's like it's it just really embodies like the pursuit of something, and there's not really challenges when you don't allow things to be challenges, even though they are challenging. The mind, the mindset. Um, the mindset of everything. This is yeah. temporary. What mm -hmm. I have is the present. I might mm -hmm. tend to fixate on the past or perhaps over worry about the future. Um, I've, I've heard often, I forget the original content source, um, but if we dwell on the past, uh, it's more like a psychology, spiritual lens. But if we're fixated with always focusing on the past, it can breed depression and resentment. If we're fixated on always trying to look at the future, it could breed anxiety and over controlling tendencies and going back to like the classic work of so many great teachers. Um, all we really have is the present. So I love your quote of choice because anything that we're going through is temporary as we know, and segueing into more of a cultural conversation, especially when it comes to cultural change management and how that pans out in organizations, specifically um, nonprofits, K-12, districts, K-12 adjacent organizations. So I have a few questions specifically. And in this segment, we go more granular with your areas of expertise, Jeff, and it's the frequently asked questions. So the frequently asked questions to Jeff, and um, one of these is based off of you and I uh, connected recently, and you gave me this quote and you said, health is a group effort. And of course, me being me, I was like, oh, well, that could apply to spiritual health financial health, like all the things. And it's true because we are more accountable when we have others around us um, for whatever reason that may be. Sometimes it can be positive, negative, whatever, but often we tend to be more accountable and sometimes motivated when we have group. Um, but that was a powerful quote to me that you stated. I want to know what that means to you as a professional and doing what you do what does that mean when it comes to organizations taking responsibility for employee benefits and how those are implemented? So I want to start broad with that quote, and then we'll get a little more granular with some specific questions that I think could be helpful to organizations and leaders who see this. Yeah, and I think I think that's that's a brilliant question. And I think I'd like to probably show a visual to show you what it, what, it, what it looks like, it feels like, it means. Is that Perfect. cool with you? That wasn't Perfect. jazz hands. That was like um, symbols. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, nah, I think I was, I was trying to figure that one out. <laughs> but yeah, I think I think it's to show you a visual, but like at the end of the day, like health is a group effort. I think at the end of the day, um, we speak about culture, right? Uh, and the reason why it's a health is a group effort is you have to create a mindset and a culture that is really important for just people to be healthy. Research has shown healthy people are just more productive. So from a selfish aspect, if your organization, you want to drive outcomes, having your people be healthy is extremely important. But for human aspect, it's really important. And for financial aspect, like unhealthy people cost a lot of money as well. So healthy community actually is better for everyone else because then the money can go back into helping people do other things. So what I want to do is actually show a lens that I we leverage at my current company where I'm an advisor, NFP, to actually begin to do work with organizations. So we use this lens to showcase how we think about things and how we encourage anybody we partner with to think okay. about things, the conditions for them to create healthy conditions for people. So I'm gonna throw this up really quickly. Let me know if you see the screen. It's, Can you guys see it? It's coming through and we see it. So perfect, I'm gonna jump in this really quickly. So at NFP, we have something called like the total awards halos or halo, or I say like a total award lens. And it's a model for evaluating what's important to employees and the HR platform to support them. So you think about your people. So when you think about having a total award lens, first, if you look at the peripheral, right? The mm -hmm. first thing you have to do is what's in my locus and control as an organization? What is my organization design factors? That means what is your mission? What is your vision? What is your values? 
What are the things that make your organization live and breathe? That's really, really important. When you identify, you really know those, how they look like, sound like, and feel like, then you have structures in place that's very clear and transparent to people about what the organization represents. On the other side of the factors, external factors, these are things you actually can't control. You can't control COVID-19. Mm-hmm. Control a recession happening. That's why when some things you can't control happen, it's important for you to really dig deep on your organization design factor because those are things you have in your right. locus control. Right. Then if you take a look inside, there's different components that's really, really important to organizations. This look pretty for display, like they're all even. It's just for visual aspect. But the reality is different uh-huh. organizations have different things that mean a lot to them. But typically what they are is compensation, benefits, well-being, leadership effectiveness and support, community impact, work environment and resources, learning and development and diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging yep. um, as a framework set organization leverage to make sure at the end of the day, these are key things that people really care about. But we traditionally learn though, two things that matter or the most as a foundational standpoint is organization needs to create principles and guiding posts for their compensation and benefits. Why? Mm. Because typically people want to know why they get paid for things, what's going on, and how they're going to get paid long term. And it's really important for organizations to be clear and upfront and transparent about that. The second thing is benefits. You need to have guiding principles of what you want for your people when you think about how you're going to create things that are beneficial to them. Right. And once you have a philosophy connects to these two things, it allows you to then figure out these other huge pieces as well. Whether in your organization, the major focus should be community impact because that's what the people in your environment really, really truly cares about. Or it's like well-being. What are some other ways people can be well within your organization? Or it, honestly, this is where a lot of things fall short. Leadership, effectiveness, and support. Sometimes you can have all the other pieces. You can have great competition, great benefits, but when your leadership effectiveness and support's not there, people leave you. And yeah, then when and you're you, not, if you're not engaging me in feedback that's meaningful, the coaching, yeah. all those different programs for ongoing learning, all that stuff. Yeah, I don't, yeah, it don't matter as much to me. And what we notice that when you have all these pieces and they can vary depending on your, or, your district, your school right. organization, your profit, the most important thing after that is how it's communicated to employees. Right. Communication exactly. is everything. And this yep. is research that's shown this. We can use Dr. Muhammad's work in education. You can use, um, communication guys but communication when it's clear it actually builds trust so what ends up happening is that a lot of organizations tend to not effectively communicate and the thing is about that is that sometimes people have great things in these spaces but it's not communicated effectively to who the employees because at the end of the day all these pieces conditionally create the employee's experience so at the center of all the stuff is your employee and how what's really important i urge organizations to think about is how people are experiencing it. So, so that's the, the that workplace means. experience. Yes. So all these pieces fill in place, like how people experience composition, how people experience benefits, how people experience your organization design factor. That's what matters the most. And we're in a time period where the education sector um, is battling for talent. We're hurting. We're hurting. We're battling for talent. So, and, and the thing about this too, what's really important, usually when it comes to benefits, it's the second big, biggest budget line in organizations um finances. So yeah. when people yeah, period in any yeah. industry. Any in industry. So when people are not thinking about it and not stewarding it and not creating philosophies and guideposts around it, they mm-hmm. leave themselves liable for losing people. And I say this much too. When it goes really, really well, it's because people are actually being strategic and intentional about it. When it doesn't go well, it's because people use it as a check mark. Yes, we have this. Right. And that and at the end of the day, you have to think about it. In my people, the people that that work for my organization, how do they feel about this? How do they see this? And do they see this as a beneficial aspect to their life? And that's really, really important. And the reason why this is important to me yeah. is being someone that's working in education and led organizations, I've sacrificed a lot of things as it relates to like the things that I could have needed that could have helped me out become a healthier person Same. in the name doing right by kids Same. and i think we start thinking about how can we strategically intentionally think about our biggest assets which is our people because they take care of the kids that would be transformative and partnering with people that really have the same alignment 
really, really matters. And there's a, um, I forget who I said it. It's probably a colleague or someone we actually probably have known or met both of us at some point. I don't know, but there's somebody who says, um, if you don't feed the teachers, they'll eat the children. I know yeah. so many people say it, but in schools in particular, right? When you're on the front line serving, and again, this is both Jeff and I's backgrounds in part of our backgrounds, we've done a number of things, but um, when we're not understanding boots on the ground, no matter the sector, what employees are experiencing, um, that is what I get passionate about. That's what we do. We have a plethora of employee engagement surveys, um, a number of them that we've now conducted some national studies on. And in our model, Jeff, it's funny because at the very center of our cultural capacity model, which by the way, is the same model we apply, whether it's through a learning program or developing an accountability system that is shared with organizations, either way, what it revolves around is internal and external communications. Because whether I am working on improving something just as an individual, I should be engaging these things to really understand how am I growing my capacity? Um, that is why I try to encourage throughout these podcast episodes, especially with guests, if you hear something that you go, oh, well, that's different. Say that you heard um, Jeff share about his anthem song, right? Or any other guest. And you go, well, I don't really like Jay-Z. He uses curse words or whatever your reaction is. I'm making <laughs> things up because we like that's actually how practice happens with expanding your capacity of understanding others. Jeff didn't say, oh, you all should have this as your favorite song. No, I asked him, what is your anthem? Why? Because it told me something more about who he is and what he values, period. Hey. And also, if I were to throw a party for him for his birthday, no, okay. So I say that because I 100% agree. Like we often skip the step of communicating, whether it's spending time to reflect within ourselves as leaders, that's also communicating with self and actually pausing or whether it's being intentional about how we educate about benefits. So that leads me to a little bit more loaded question, but it has to do with cultural change too. And probably yeah. one that a lot of orgs are getting and a lot of my sweet spot has been the diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging in particular. Mm -hmm. I often find that organizations are still struggling to have a holistic lens and it's still like a, well, we hired a chief diversity officer, but now we can't afford that person or now that's under HR when organizations, they're intent, they they really are wanting to do better with how they see the world, how they attract and retain talent, how they engage talent when they're there uh, working with their organization. What are what's a way that an organization, if they say, "Look, how do these fit together, Jeff? How does DEIB benefit, or how could it be? How could employee benefits be a vehicle to actually support?" diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging efforts. Is there, are there ways to do that? <laughs> I mean, I, th I think two things. I go back to actually um, what I mentioned earlier is like, I think organizations need to absorb a total award lens because that is a part of the process. And then when you begin to actually have philosophies of why you pay people, that's like an equitable thing. Not, it's not saying we have a DEIB expert, but no, like we believe that everyone should be paid equitably and here's how. And then that actually seeps into that space because the whole purpose of things being equitable and people are consistently thinking about the different types of people that enter organization and understand that. The second thing too, like I think baseline is like you have stuff that two things that organization can use. It's like use your employee census and then use survey to actually guide where you're going. I think a lot of times we make decisions based on the vacuum of like what we think it is, but the reality is you got to get it for the people just because X amount of your working population is African-American or Latinx or mm -hmm. women or mm -hmm. metal or or um, part of the LGBTQ. Sing single mothers, like even demographics yeah. like yeah. that, right? Yeah. Every, Two yeah, parent household. That. Exactly. You, yeah. It's good to actually leverage that and understand it and create a space. But I think even before that, like... Putting what we do is a lot of like we we're educated at the core we're still educators right and Dr. Muhammad does has, says this great thing like what we try to do all the time is technical change right we mm. we hire a person we 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 change this this structure we 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 hire someone to do the DEIB we we say all these things we hire we get this curriculum because yeah adopt Apple, a new curriculum yeah we adopt a new curriculum we do all these pieces or you know we 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 just get this benefits and think it's going to work out. But the reality, Dr. Muhammad says this, this quote where he's like, you know, 
culture is like rich soil. Mm -hmm. When it's rich, you can put a half bitten seed in it and it will grow. Mm. However, when coach when that soil is tilted and the soil was not great, you could put the best seed in it and nothing will grow. Mm. And I think all too often people don't take a step back to identify their vision of excellence of what type of culture that they want to have. Because what happens when you think about the type of culture, you want to say, like, I actually want to be inclusive. And then that defines what does that mean for you? Right. If right. you think about your culture, like we want to have one where everybody gets a fair shot to their potential. Then you're thinking about how to remove barriers for everybody in that organization. Right. Which should actually include the people that are most marginalized and held against that. But the framework is the habits and behaviors that we have and the level of thinking that we have is thinking about that. And I think what organizations tend to, what I'll say they shift to it is they haven't defined the type of culture that they want to have. And they actually define the type of technical things they want to use first. Mm -hmm. And that can be problematic. You can have the best benefits in the world, but if your culture sucks, it ain't going to grow. You can have the best DEIB person in the nation. Mm -hmm. If your culture sucks, they will leave. Yep. You know what I mean? So like, I, I go back to saying that people need to actually first like design the type of culture that they really want to have and understand why. Because if not, your culture, same thing in the classroom. If you don't yeah, create your yeah. culture, culture will create itself. That's right. And I think That's right. too often people create the code, the culture create the, the self and they get caught in a cycle of constantly having to just do technical change. And we all know technical change does not move the needle. So yeah, that, it's not the long-term sustainable, right? That, long -term. And, and that's one thing that always sticks out to me too about uh, Dr. Muhammad's work. I think it's in his Transforming School Culture book, but he lists maybe five or six indicators of what actually develops sustainable transformational change. And the two that always struck me as like the most pivotal, and I think perhaps this is in his research as the most indicative of, of that sustainability is... Um, Empl employee willingness to confront colleagues mm -hmm. and flexibility and adaptability. Yep, exactly. So I, I think those that always sticks out to me. One, of, I know you and I share a favorite, many of us in the world share a favorite quote in Peter Drucker when he says, culture eats strategy for breakfast, but I would be remiss if I didn't ask you one strategy question. <laughs> so even though we're culture people, we love culture and also the, the the change management process and how we engage the people, all the people, um, what would be some health strategies? A very much more specific question in case we have some leaders from different organizations watching. What are some specific health strategies to consider for small versus mid-sized organizations or school districts? Small versus mid-sized, because that's actually a, a, a large majority of businesses, school districts, et cetera. And often uh, our resources are much leaner. And so we go, well, well what, yeah. what are a couple strategies that people could start with in the mid versus small arenas? I mean, I think I'll, I'll just name a few, and I and I and I and, I, and, that's, and I'll say the mid small. I think the smaller ones is, is a definitely a, a different conversation because those okay. are considered groups less than fifty employees, and I can dive into that deeper a different time. But I'm going to say okay. the mid one with like between fifty to like three hundred employees, right? Okay. Uh, why is it's important? I think the first thing this goes for both, whether you're small or mid size, like really define your total award lens. The reason why, and they really define like what it looks like. What is your philosophy? And if that's too strenuous. Actually, just start off by based on saying, say, like, what is my compensation philosophy? What is my benefits philosophy? Like, mm. what is my And by that, saying, like, a, a statement that says, like, we pay people this. We believe when it comes to compensation, we do this. And this is our principles that guide us. Yeah. Equity. Transparency. Value. Um, Value-based. blah, And then that guides how you do that. And then that, that's, a, that's a guidepost that, that supports me. The second thing, same thing with benefits. Like we believe in a healthy culture, um, no matter what. Healthy mm -hmm. people um, get, are more productive. And that's our guidepost. And then now you're held accountable, to be quite frank with you, by your people because right. you have right. a guidepost. Right. That's the number one thing. The second thing I think is really important is that as you think about health strategies for your organization, it's like, actually, who do you partner with? At the end of the day, unless you're an organization that go directly um, to the market yourself, to right. be quite frank, you likely partner with a broker. Right. And what I, my challenge is, don't partner with a broker. Partner with someone that's more consultative, uh, consultative yeah. or an advisor 
because a broker is just a piece of the work when you're thinking about your healthcare strategy, right? Mm -hmm. It's like just going out there, going to the market, getting a quote, bringing it back to you. When the reality, which is a check mark, mm -hmm. when the reality is there's proactive things people can do to help you think about your people and the person should be an extension of your team that's critically doing the work around helping you understand your HR and your health strategies so you can do right by your people. And then so you as a team can focus on the main thing is figuring out how to help your people serve their kids. So I think that's really important. Right. And the profile of a broker, I, th I think that's strong is someone that's that's proactive, not reactive, that has an approach when they meet you throughout the year that just don't wait to open enrollment, but has a conversation with you throughout the year. Yeah. So yeah. after your enrollment happens, they should check in with you. In the middle of the year, they should check in with you. And then they should say, like, how do we have a communication strategy for the upcoming year? And then they should be evaluating what went well for you this year, what didn't go well for you, and what are some things that you want based on your employee data, and then leverage that to inform the following year. That's really important. So the first thing is have a philosophy of comp and benefits. The second thing is find the right fit partner that's going to help drive you based on your values, vision, et cetera. And the last piece I think is really important is when you have a strong broker that's truly an advisor, they're going to educate you on the spectrum of options that you have. Yeah. So when you think about it, health benefits are your second largest budget line. Yeah. So at the end of the day, when you have cost savings in that area, you can take that and put it right back into your people. But in order for you to do that, you kind of have to know what the spectrum and ranges are of you as well. So one quick tip I would say is if your advisor or broker is not talking to you about the difference between what it means to be fully funded health insurance program versus what is else the difference to be self-insured and it's taking the time to explain what those means and allow you to understand why you are in one of those um, programs or why you are not in the other, that's going to help you out completely. So I think the last piece is educating you co holistically on all yeah. your options as a group so then you can make the right choice for, for the right time, which is right now, but also think about what it means for you and the organization in the future. And I right. think that's right. really, really important. And I, and, do, you, and I, do you offer that as well, Jeff, as far is, as consulting? consultative that is, and is, especially with your lens of knowing, Hey, if this is your strategic plan goals, how do we yeah. align your benefit strategy? Do you do that, that work as well? That, that's, that is the, that is at, actually at the core of what we do at NFP. Okay. And that's how we see the world. We, we, we don't look at it at the lens of just brokering a deal, brokering. Like here, uh, sign uh, this, this is your yeah. benefits package. Yeah. <laughs> we look at it as actually understanding what's the best way to meet what you need. Some people cost the most important thing. Some people educating their employees and their engagements, the most important thing. Yeah. Some people cost and education. We yeah. figure out strategic ways to actually understand what you really need and do our best within the confines that you have to really, really match it through a consultative approach. And that's what really, that's what really matters. So yes, we do that work. And there's some other groups that do similar work that's, that's really right. good at it. And there's some people that don't do well at it as well. But yeah. my thing is, if you find somebody, it, it needs to be someone that's fully educating you on all your spectrums for today, tomorrow, yeah. and the day after that. And that's going to give you the spectrum because this is a long game. As in education right now, SF funds drying up, there's a financial cliff. cliff. People are giving teachers signing bonuses to keep them. You know, People had additional money to take care of the people. That's going to run out. So every dollar yeah. counts. That's to right. go back to kids or to go back to your staff. So if you're not thinking and forecasting strategies in advance, you're going to be too behind. And you need a partner that's going to stretch you, listen to you, understand you and be an extension of your team because it will be a great partner, will mention it and let you make the best decision based off of that every single time. And they'll, make, they'll give you your opinion, but they will land what matters the most to you. And I'll share this story. So the difference between fully funded and self-funded, right? But when you're self-funded, you have access to more data to understand the health of your organization. When you're fully funded, wow. you get information, but it's not as accurate or as direct as self-funded. Okay. But by getting that information, we, we were working with a group where we was able to leverage it to actually drive down their price and their fully insured um, deal as well. So the thing about it is too, is someone that's going to advocate and think about strategies to ensure that they're doing right by your people. And that's really, okay. really important as, as well. And I think... Um, um, the last piece is someone that's going to advocate for you and think about you and want to be the extension of your team. So I, 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 yeah, I love this part of talking about because being someone that's in education, being on this side of the game is really, really important because sometimes I think when we're in education, we just stay in one lane of it. That's, that's great. But when we start spreading out 
outside of it and bring back what we've learned and experienced to do that, I think it's really, really powerful. Because I, when, in my role right now as a principal, I wish I would have thought more about how to retain and attract folks. I wish I didn't have, you know, it's time I did have a check spot mentality with benefits. I wish it would have been like a strategy. I wish I would understand the demographic data and did better jobs on surveys to keeping yep. my people. Yep. I did I didn't because I was too busy focusing on one thing because I didn't have that knowledge and I didn't understand that now on the other side, I'm trying to actually remedy things that I wish I had and is actually paying yeah. it forward. Yeah, similar. So y'all know you you're, you're gonna see in the comments, you know how to find us, but we are going to link some different resources that that Jeff shares and specifically his LinkedIn profile, just like we do for all of our guests. However, I, I have to close this out. You can't get off the hook with the final two questions. Okay, inner child. So this, this question always goes back to a key principle that little Jeff, when you were seven or eight, key principle that you can trace back to little you. And so basically something that you were taught and it's just stuck with you and you're like, yeah, that's still me to my core. Um, I, I, I lived by this as a kid or a teacher taught me this or my mother taught me this and I still live by that same principle now. Yeah, I'm going to say two things. Humility, there's always something bigger than you and then results over reasons. At the end of the day, mm. you can get things done or you have reasons for not getting it done. And the results don't mean like you actually get it done, but it's the pursuit and process um, of and making it. So like you can you know, get, and the results is not like, you know, I'm going to be a millionaire or I'm going to get all these things, but the pursuit of you going after it yeah. and that process is the learning opportunity. And then that means like you don't have a reason because you actually identify what the gap is because you pursued it and you learned from it. And there's nothing better than being able to learn from uh, being able to learn and growing. So I'll yeah. say that humility is key to me because I have something a bit deeper belief um, beyond me. And mm. then it's like, I, I just believe in like either you get results or you have a reason for not getting results. Yeah. And that's it. <laughs> um, finally, unapologetically living out your purpose, Jeff. What are you working on now specifically? Where can we find you? Should we be on the lookout for any professional things you have in the works or ways that you want professional orgs to contact you? That was a bunch. But you tell us all the things as far as what we should know about Jeff. And number one, if I'm a leader who's hearing this and I go, ooh, yeah, I, could, I probably need to hop on a call with him. How, how do people do that? How do they begin their journey of working with someone like yourself, you, or again, going down this path of being more intentional just in general with how they provide benefits for employees? Yeah, two things. So do NFP, which I mentioned is a national global insurance, it's a national slash global insurance brokers firm. I am an advisor. So okay. if you, anything that deals with benefits, 401ks, 401bs, and you really want strategy around that, feel free to email me at my NFP email address, which I'll give and share, and we can have a conversation like that. How my approach typically is this. We have a phone call. The first phone call is actually just a discovery call. What the discovery call allows me to understand your organization and what is your true pain points and what's going on. And just allows me to see where you are. Secondary, after we have that information, I typically then come back and present based on what I heard from you. Then I share about the capabilities of what NFP can do. And then after that point in time, we see whether you'd want to move on. And then we talk strategically what timeline and everything else looks like. And I introduce you to actually keep on this. This is a team effort. Like I have actually a team that supports everything that happens. And I think what's really important, like I mentioned earlier, my goal is to impact a million lives um, mm. through benefits in the education realm. And what that really means is how I equate this is this way. Take the number amount of employees that we're impacting, and then we look at the enrollment of the students in the school. Put those together e equals the impact goal. In the next five years, if we can get to a million lives where we impact in it intentionally, then we're actually fundamentally changing, changing the structure approach of how people have benefits in their lives because it is a core to the employee experience. Yeah. I'm not doing this just because I want to just do benefits. Like, no, it is a huge piece. If you have more than 50 employees, you have to have this. This is a policy driven way. So your people experience matter. So yeah. I want to, I want to leverage that as an entry point to make sure I'm tapping into to schools and structures. Second thing, to be honest with you with that, um, the more we get clients to do right by, the more we create a culture around what employee benefits can look like and be for the future. Right. So it's also 
important for me to do this work because we won't, like we mentioned, we want to be a part of creating a culture of yeah. great kitchens and schools or education entities across the country. Yep. And I'm not geographically bound. We can do this work anywhere. Yeah. Secondly, yeah. I actually have my own consulting company. Um, and it's, you know, our name is Board Education and Transformation BET, where I actually focus on yeah. other things, support schools. Um, along the lines where like I do school culture audits. Yep. I coach as a, I'm an executive coach for school leaders. I help people with strategy. I've actually helped people get elected for school board. Mm -hmm. I've uh, done keynote speaks uh, speeches uh, connected to the instruction and my strategy around. Um, board education and um, transformation is also connected to Dr. Anthony Muhammad's work. Yes. Um, where I focus on any we focus we have three pronged approaches. First, we focus on the adults. Then we shift to creating strong tier one structures for the students, and then we really seal the deal with creating two strong priorities around achievement, which is intellectual preparation and looking at student work. Mm. We feel it's the foundations of actually creating excellence within schools. And this and there's, there's multiple steps that we take in each area. But I, like I said, is we focus on the adult culture first, then we create strong tier one structures with the student culture and a high effort. I mentioned, I forgot to say, we create a high effort mm -hmm. um, for students. And then last but not least, we really drive teachers, leaders, and anyone that believes that can do anything with instruction around how do they actually intellectually prepare, but then how do they actually look at student work? So the intellectual preparation is an ind indication of what you sh is, is by intellectual preparing. You then can see how worthwhile your intellectual preparation was yep. by looking at student work. And I do that work across the country. Currently, right now, I'm doing work in St. Louis. Um, I did work in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I've done work in California with school districts um, as large as, um, you know, 20,000 students. I did keynote space and I, I would continue to do that work as a passion, but it intersects with my work currently as a benefits provider because it's an entry point to understand what matters the most. And for me, I'm a problem solver first, any which way. So it's not yeah. really about benefits thing. If that's not your problem, if I still can help solve a problem, I will. And that's how I see myself as well. So on the benefits end, I'll close out by saying, just reach out to me. And mm -hmm. if you just want to have a conversation, discovery conversation, it will kick it off. It's a very structured approach, but it's really getting to know you, your vision, et cetera. And the people that I look for to connect to is HR directors, mm -hmm. um, school founders, executive directors, superintendents, or talent leaders um, in, in, in the education space. Yeah. Um, and anyone else that if you need instructional or leadership support, I also do that as well. So I, I don't I don't separate. I still love you get a hey you all listen to what he's saying. If you are a school leader and you need a one two, <laughs> um, there's there's a lot of room for wiggle room. I know I share that as well as far as just the different endeavors and paths that I've chosen. And Jeff, uh, I can't say enough great things about you. I, I've told other people about you and the work that you're up to already um, because I often get questions, right? In our spaces when we're doing work, we there is always plenty to go around for everyone, number one. Um, I know that we both hold that belief, but I also, when I hear a need and it's not something that I do or have any knowledge or understanding that is why it's been very, very important to me. I'm going on seven years with my consulting firm to have strategic partnerships and strategic even just alignment so that I know if I'm referring somebody to Jeff, I know he's going to take care of them. So you have my public support, even though you're not running for an office right now, but you have my public support. Um, I'm really excited for you. And then the work you're continuing to do is always a pleasure to catch up, sir. And I just love getting to bear witness to your journey. And I'm honored that you you stopped by here to spend some time. I'm grateful as well. Um, and I appreciate um, your ability to extend yourself and extend your network to me as well. Always. I'm passionate about people. I'm passionate about solving problems. And I'm passionate about creating education outcomes um, for all kids, but particularly Black, Brown, and ones that are, you know, are in places that they don't have the advantages. Yeah, and they don't have access. My ultimate goal is to ensure that, you know, everything we do is for the kids, but it's about the adults. And I want to be that, um, I want to have that entry point, whether it's through benefits, strategy, or whether it's doing direct work with leaders as well. I just want to be there to really support. And don't forget, the goal is a million lives over the next five years. Right. And every time y'all do that, if y'all connect with people, we can talk about it, that allows us to build a movement around that. And this, once again, is a movement that's not individual things, a collective effort, and everyone can be a part of it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for tuning in. Be sure you hit the subscribe button. 
Make sure you check out the resources. We always link the resources in the show notes. This has been a conversation with Jeffrey Benellis. And I am so grateful that you all have joined in as we always close every episode. And what Jeff reminded us of today is to not choose compliance over compassion in any realm that we're serving in, but especially that realm of considering benefits and how we engage our people's voices along the way. So as we close out every episode, let's continue to get compassionately curious together. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.